With the release of Sonic Mania less than a month away, I thought it would be worth doing a couple videos to revisit Sega's last attempt to make a return to 2D classic Sonic. No, no, not Sonic Generations, no. We're going straight for the long-awaited sequel to Sonic 3 & Knuckles, Sonic the Hedgehog 4 Episode 1. Critics loved it, Sonic fans hated it, and six and a half years later, with the release of the very promising Sonic Mania just on the horizon, most of us are probably trying to forget it ever existed. But it's important that we all remember the mistakes we've made, lest we be doomed to repeat them. And with that in mind, let's take a look at this game and see if we can figure out just what the hell went wrong. Before Sega handed the reins of the classic Sonic franchise over to the fans for Sonic Mania, for Sonic 4 they entrusted the task to Dimps, the developers of the Sonic Advance and Rush games. So we're not dealing with a studio completely inexperienced with the series here. In spite of that, most fans agree that Sonic 4 really missed the mark. And as soon as I started playing this game again, I really felt this. To put it simply, it just feels all wrong. Of course, it's not enough for me to just say it feels wrong, so I'm gonna do my best to explain why. The very first thing that hit me was the music. I mean, listen to it. It's all synthetic beeps and boops. I mean, of course the music in the original Genesis Sonic games was synthetic too, but at least the different instruments in the sound chip had some variety to them. Here it's just... beeps and boops. It doesn't help that it's repetitive as all hell. Classic Genesis Sonic tunes, especially the ones from Sonic 2 onward, had a heap of variety and personality in their composition. Sonic 4 songs just seemed like the same small samples of music on repeat again and again and again. It's soulless and robotic, which is completely antithetical to what you'd think Sonic music should be like, full of attitude and personality. The second thing that hit me is how the game looks. Sonic, as well as most of the interactive elements in the levels, are 3D models. At a glance, the backgrounds look 3D too, but these are actually composed of 2D sprites that are designed to look 3D. I can't say for sure whether the backgrounds are made up of pre-rendered 3D models or if they're hand-drawn. It's not the background graphics being 2D that puts me off, it's the dissonance of art style this game has going on. When you look at Sonic, or any of the Badniks for example, you have a very blatant, cartoony, cel-shaded style with a lot of contrast. The backgrounds on the other hand are way softer in their shading, and in spite of trying to look 3D, are pretty blatantly flat. I mean, if Sonic, the Badniks, and the interactive elements in the stages all had 2D hand-drawn sprites in the style of the background, then I could say this game has a coherent art style. I could also say that if the backgrounds were all in proper 3D and had the same cartoony, cel-shaded style that Sonic has. But as it stands, this game feels like it has two competing and clashing art styles going on, and as a result, comes off as really unprofessional and a bit ugly. Anyway, as concerning as all this stuff about the sound and graphics is, neither of those are the main reason people were disappointed with this game. The fundamental issue lies in Sonic 4's gameplay. This can be summed up in one word. Momentum. I'm not just gonna leave it there though, I'm gonna take a shot at trying to explain the problem here. Bear with me, as I'm not really an expert on this stuff by any means, though I have played enough classic Sonic to have a rough idea. If you're running and you let go of the directional key or joystick, Sonic will stop moving in about a second. If you're jumping and you let go, he'll drop straight down just about instantly. Now compare that to this footage of Sonic 3 and Knuckles. As you can see, Sonic conserves a lot of momentum even after you stop holding down on the controller. I'm actually releasing the directional button at the peak of his jumps here, but you can barely tell because he keeps going anyway. Now, back to Sonic 4. See what I mean? The momentum-based gameplay that made Sonic so popular back in the 90s and set him apart from the other 2D platformers of the time is replicated pretty poorly in Sonic 4. A very important way to gain momentum in classic Sonic games was to roll into a ball. If you rolled down a ramp or through a loop, you could gain a lot of speed that you wouldn't have been able to had you simply been running. Take a look at this footage from Sonic 4. In the older Sonic games, you'd be able to gain momentum each time you rolled down the walls on the sides until eventually you had enough height to go up. Here, you don't gain any momentum or height at all, it's just an infinite loop of disappointment. A lot of the time, it's far more effective to simply run up a wall rather than bother with a spin dash, which is pretty counterintuitive considering that's meant to be the spin dash's main purpose. There are, of course, the other oddities with Sonic's movement that people just love to make fun of, but at the end of the day, the main reason Sonic 4 Episode 1 doesn't feel like Sonic is because its momentum physics are a very poor replication of the original games. Perhaps the worst part is that it seems like the developers knew the physics sucked, 
The mind-boggling abundance of boosters and springs seems to serve to distract from how flawed and unsonic the game really is. More time being boosted and sprung around means less time to grapple with the reality of what Sonic 4 really is, which is a poorly executed imitation of the golden era classic Sonic games. I mean, if you're gonna present a game as an official sequel to a much-loved franchise, you'd better make damn sure it at least gets the fundamentals right. And a Sonic game's movement and physics might just be the most important factor in how it plays. Sonic 4 Episode 1 has four main zones. Green Hill Zone, Casino Night Zone, Labyrinth Zone, and Metropolis Zone. Each zone has three normal acts and one boss act. Unusually for a classic style Sonic game, you can play these in any order, except for the boss acts which you can't play until you complete the three main acts for that zone. For my playthrough I did all the levels in order, because damn it, that's how we did it back in my day. Wait, hold on a second, what do you mean I got the level names wrong? It's actually Splash Hill? Casino Street? Ha! <laughs> Don't make me laugh. First up, Green Hill Zone from Sonic 1. There's not a lot to say here, it's all pretty ordinary. The boss is the same as it was in Sonic 1, except for a new attack Eggman uses when he's low on health. Good on them for changing something up, I guess. Second is Casino Night, or Street, or whatever, Zone. I didn't have a lot of trouble with the first two acts, but the third one did give me a fair bit. This level is jam-packed with all sorts of bullshit, a lot of it involving these cannons you launch yourself out of. There's so many points where you end up in an area with cannons, but have no idea which direction you need to fire in to proceed, so you're forced to just try everywhere until it works. The worst example of this is probably this one here. Just one cannon, so you gotta use a bit of trial and error. Oh, fuck you! Once all this bullshit's finally out of the way, it's time to fight the boss. Well, 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 look what the cat dragged in. Yup, it's the Casino Night boss from Sonic 2. Another recycled boss fight. Does this one have any extra attacks, though? I don't know, I think I beat it too quickly. After that, I can just leave through the right. Wait, wait no. I just wanna leave, please. Lost Labyrinth Zone is next. The first act is mostly rolling around on balls, alternating with mediocre platforming sections, and the second act is... What? Why do I have a torch? For the entire second act, Sonic carries this giant torch around. In a Sonic game, it's important to have a decent field of view so that you can see obstacles coming up ahead and have time to react to them. Clearly, the developers forgot this, because for the most part, this level is pitch black, save for the small area around Sonic. Occasionally, you pass by unlit torches which light up the room you're in after you touch them. But you get to enjoy this for all of one second before you end up in the next room where it's dark again. There are also these bits of wall with dynamite attached that you blow up by lighting a fuse attached to them. Normally the fuse is right in your path anyway, so these walls basically just explode in front of you as you go. There's nothing dynamic or interesting about this at all. It adds completely nothing to the gameplay of the level aside from trying to distract you from how boring it really is. The worst part, though, is right here. There are four torches, each of them activating a specific column. You need to light these in the right order and with the right timing to be able to get past. I just found this really confusing and not fun or intuitive at all. Even when I thought I had it figured out, the timing always seemed wonky and it never seemed to work the way it should've. I even managed to time out after spending about 7 minutes on this bullshit. Miraculously I managed to get past it eventually, but I didn't feel rewarded or satisfied so much as I was glad I'd never have to deal with this crap again as long as I live. The boss for this zone is... the boss from Labyrinth Zone in Sonic 1. Except this time there's an extra phase where Eggman attacks you with crushing pillars, which as far as I know is an original concept. Then we have Mad Gear, which is... I mean... Look at it. It's Metropolis Zone from Sonic 2. Much like Lost Labyrinth Zone, this level uses a rehashed classic Sonic boss, but with a new phase added. Here you just have to chase Eggman and hit him while avoiding explosive miniatures of himself. Wait, what the fuck? Oh fuck, no. Once you've beaten all four boss acts, a short cutscene plays to show that you've unlocked the final act. Death Egg Zone from Sonic 2. Okay, fine. Egg Station Zone. Sheesh. Here you face a boss rush featuring all four battles you've already faced, though in the case of Lost Labyrinth and Mad Gear Zones, you only fight their second segments, and all the bosses seem to take a couple less hits to beat. The final boss is clearly based on Sonic 2's. It takes a shit ton of hits in a very long time to beat, and about halfway through the fight it malfunctions and its attacks become more erratic. Alright, it's taken me a lot of attempts, but it looks like I'm finally about to win. Ah, 
Are you fucking kidding me? Sonic 4, are you trying to make me dislike you more than I already do? Because I think it's working. As much as I wanted to stop playing right then and there, I forced myself to try again a few times and eventually beat him by landing a hit on him as soon as he comes down. Great. After this, I get a shitty imitation of Sonic 1's ending cutscene. The designers probably thought this would make me nostalgic or something. I'm feeling a lot of things right now, but nostalgia isn't one of them. I gotta say, this shitty imitation of Sonic 1's ending cutscene is a pretty apt metaphor for how this entire game is a shitty imitation of classic Sonic in general. Yeah, thanks, but no thanks. Much like in Sonic 1, if you finish an act with 50 rings or more, you'll get the opportunity to jump into a giant ring to access a special stage. If you can make it to the end before time runs out, you get one of the 7 Chaos Emeralds. Visually, they look just like Sonic 1's special stages, but in reality, they're quite different. Rather than the board rotating on its own and you controlling Sonic by making him jump, this time around, you control the board's rotation manually but have no control over Sonic himself. I got the first emerald on my very first attempt at these stages, but the second was a different story. I jumped into the ring and attempted the stage a bunch of times over the course of my playthrough, but with only one exception it ended in exactly the same way. This one fucking bumper would hit me into these exact fucking exit tiles. I even tried to go back to get the second emerald again after I beat the final boss, but the same shit would just happen again and again. It seemed impossible to avoid and I honestly couldn't be bothered with it, especially considering you had to play a whole act through to the end every time you wanted a shot at the special stage. There's nothing fun or interesting about the special stages, and apparently your only reward for beating them all is the ability to turn into Super Sonic and a slightly different ending cutscene. Big whoop. Aside from trying for Chaos Emeralds, you can also replay levels to compete on the online leaderboards. You can do this in either Score Attack or Time Attack mode. Your choice of mode pretty much just determines which set of leaderboards you're going for, the highest scores or the lowest times. There's no practical change in gameplay based on which mode you pick, aside from the fact that special stage rings won't appear in Time Attack mode. I don't see the need to make the distinction between the two so-called modes. Why not just let people replay the levels and decide for themselves which leaderboard they want to go for. Of course, I'm ignoring the obvious elephant in the room, which is the question of why anyone would want to be on the online leaderboards for this game in the first place. I think it's pretty clear at this point what my overall thoughts on this game are. As a platformer, it's mediocre. As a Sonic game, it's a real disappointment. I have to give the makers of this game credit where it's due. I can't imagine going about recreating a classic Sonic game from scratch is an easy task by any means, especially with all the gameplay and level design considerations that need to be made. It may be a passable platformer in its own right, but it completely misses the mark of being a satisfying follow-up to the classics. And when you're bold enough to call your game Sonic the Hedgehog 4, you better be damn sure it doesn't miss the mark on that, or people are going to be very rightfully disappointed. I can't entirely side with the critics on this game being good, or the fanbase on it being horrible. For me, it just gets a resounding... eh. I give it two and a half stars. That's for episode one, though. Who knows, maybe episode two will be better. Hmm... Tune in next time to find out.